good. Cool. So yeah, if you could just start off in giving us a bit of an introduction as to uh, who you are and uh, your relationship with Spree and, and, and what it is that you do. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so Ian Rabbage, I'm the co-founder of Alvio. Uh, Alvio is a, a platform that connects brands that are on the Shopify, WooCommerce and Jonas Sports retail platforms. Um, I have a background in brands. Uh, I've, I've been introducing brands to the UK market probably for the last sort of 28, 30 years. I've launched brands that include Snapple, Gatorade, uh, Red Bull. I've also worked in the in the um, travel industry as well. So quite a, a broad spectrum. And um, Alvio was created as a solution for some clients that the digital agency my business partners run um, in the States. And it was very, very successful as a solution for a particular problem they had. And during COVID, we turned that into a, a product. Uh, we separated the business out from the agency, created the standalone SaaS business. And here we are today, the two and a half years or so down the track, and we're, we're working across multiple different verticals, different brands, doing a lot in the sports world as well, really helping brands and, and, and their merchants that they're partnering with to pivot their business models. And what's great working with Spree is that I can actually take this commercialization piece that we're helping the brands with and then bringing Spree into the mix which then helps with a lot of the activation and bringing those brands to life. The key thing here is that we're working within e-commerce and, and how do you then tell the story of a brand and bring that brand to life and then do that final stage of commercializing the brand uh, within that e-commerce world. And, and I love what the Spree guys are doing with, uh, with the social shopping. And so what we're doing at the moment is we're starting to introduce Spree to some of the brands that we're working with, uh, looking at how Spree can then come in and help them join the dots between that activation with the consumer and then that commercialization of it. And uh, I've got some 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 really, really good feelings about how this is going to work for us all working together. Excellent. No, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely going to be, I think, a, a big 2024. And that's one of the reasons why we have you uh, in a couple of weeks time, in a few weeks time, speaking on our e-commerce predictions for 2024 which of course will include live shopping uh, as as we know and 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 social commerce can you just give us a very kind of a brief overview about what you think is going to be from your perspective and from Olivier's point perspective what do you think is going to be the sort of the leading trends the leading defining moment for e-commerce in 2024 i think it's really interesting to to see where where the trends are going and and you know we we draw upon reports that that come out from people um including pwc and also shopify uh, shopify is a, a, a really important one because obviously it is one of the leading platforms in the world now for e-commerce and and they've got great resources and they're, they're they're forever doing their research and and advising people on the platform how best to deliver best practice within e-commerce I think also it's it's very interesting to see the journey that e-commerce has taken over the last few years. It was very easy for brands to come to market five or six years ago. Uh, it was it was relatively easy and cheap to do so to drive traffic to your website. But clearly, e-commerce spiked during COVID. It be, it's become a lot more expensive to, to drive consumers to your website, and everyone's competing for those same. AdWords. So one of the biggest trends uh, into the future, and, and it's starting now, and it was certainly predicted last year, uh, and it was very heavily featured by Shopify in their trends report, and that's collaborations, it's partnerships, it's brands coming together and working together for a common good. And so we, and we can see this happening now, and we can see brands that, yes, they're, they're, they're still running a strategy where they drive traffic through PPC to their website. But actually, the really smart brands are starting to understand that there's a shared consumer out there. And if you can partner with another brand or a retailer that is already driving that demographic to their website, and you can place your brand directly into that website in front of that consumer, then it's a very, very efficient way to operate. And you're getting a, you know, a greater bang for your buck in terms of the investment. Certainly, the retailer is um, because they're they're amortizing that cost they're placing another product in front of that consumer that that is of interest to them 
And for the brand, it's again, it's taking away a lot of the, the, the risk and the friction points in trying to find new audiences and new consumers for their products. So one of the great trends for the next sort of foreseeable future is certainly going to be collaborations between like-minded brands. Yeah, and that certainly it kind of makes a lot of sense for all of the examples that you've seen. I think that we're seeing that not just in e-commerce, but kind of a whole range of different industries that these sort of partnerships, these collaborations are coming together, that brands are coming together, not just for e-commerce or even commerce generally, but just sort of coming together to 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 provide a sort of stronger together mentality. Um, the, the community has been a sort of a buzzword in 2023 and will continue to do so in 2024. Can you give some examples of some mutually beneficial partnerships that are kind of already providing value to both the brands and the consumers so can we understand how like the brands can benefit from partnering up and creating communities and and and, and you can speak a little bit about that but how can these sort of mutually beneficial partnerships provide value for both value for both the brands and the consumers yes yeah, certainly examples? i think yeah and, and i mean I'll, I'll go to sort of the 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 non sort of e-commerce and Alveo model to start with. And, and I think one of my favorite collaborations actually is an old brand that I used to work with, uh, Red Bull. It was, it was one of the brands sort of from my, from my past. And I think one of the, one of the great collaborations that, uh, that, that Red Bull did was actually, um, with GoPro. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a very, very interesting one to watch because you've got exactly the same demographic or consumer between those two brands um red bull being the product that that gives people the if you like the, the the wings to do these great things that you can then create the content using using gopro to do and obviously then gopro brings that whole thing to life so that's a that's a, a great collaboration it's one that that i always look at as being a a, a good example of two brands that share that same consumer with a like-minded mentality coming together to, to do that Within the, the the world that we're operating, the the online world, and and give you you know a good specific example from a from an Alvio perspective, is within the world of football. And what we're seeing is we have we have some brands on the Alvio network right now that are starting to collaborate with football teams to drive greater value and 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 fan engagement for the football clubs that they're working with. And traditionally, your football club selling their match day strip, et cetera, has got a fairly narrowly defined range of products that they're, that they're selling. But what we're starting to see now is that, and again, using technology like Alvio, these football clubs can then start to increase the range of products that they're offering. And they're able to bring products in and actually sell them directly within their fan store, creating greater fan engagement, increasing the basket value that's, uh, that's being generated for the club itself. And rather than having to send their fan off to a separate website somewhere else where, again, they don't get the data on those sales and they certainly don't get the full value, what we're now starting to see is that technology, technology that, 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 uh, that, that we've created is enabling these partnerships to form and it's giving the opportunity for, for those partnerships to form. And, and that's where we're seeing greater value being delivered. And from a consumer's point of view, it's a, it's a much better consumer experience just to go to one place where they know they're going to find the products that they want. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, I think, with the, with that end point about the kind of the one stop shop. I think that that um, maybe that there are plus points and downsides to that. But I think that there are lots of examples where, you know, maybe people like like Meta has started to sort of saying, that that they actually want this one-stop shop, whether that's going to be through WhatsApp or Instagram or or any of any of the platforms that they want it to be this one-stop of shopping. And some people have criticized that, you know, that that model, maybe that monopolization model. But but at the same time, obviously it has, you know, a huge benefit for the consumer. And and your only way that you're going to achieve that, as you say, is through is through these partnerships. In in there's been some criticism of, of this kind of like one-stop shop thing, I guess probably from a business perspective, but but are there sort of risks or downsides to partnerships, uh, to collaborations that that brands should be aware of before embarking on, on them? 
Certainly, I mean, you can go piling straight into a partnership without doing the the, the, the due diligence and the research first. Um, and clearly, like a, if you like any relationship that's not properly thought out, you've got some pitfalls there. I think the 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 risk would be if you're you're partnering with with a brand that doesn't share your values, for example. Um, you may be you know very you might be very focused on sustainability, where you're not going to partner with somebody who has uh, single use plastics and and doesn't have a great sustainability policy. But I think the core the core piece that any any partnership or any any brands that are collaborating need to be thinking about is always the consumer because everything starts and finishes with the consumer if you don't if you're not both reaching out to that same consumer demographic if you're not sharing a consumer that is either a demographic from a, um, a financial position or from a, an ethics position then it's a partnership that isn't going to work particularly well it won't flourish so a key first step is always to identify are we targeting that same consumer and is this collaboration coming together to benefit that consumer and if it does then the knock-on effect if you like the second order effect is that the two brands coming together and collaborating will also get a benefit from that do you think that there's a part of that in regards as when you're doing the research when you're trying to kind of figure out whether those partnerships are a right fit do you think that there needs to be a wariness of sort of searching for the, the shiny big thing uh as, as it were so being able to kind of focus on you mentioned sort of football clubs you know for, as an example focusing maybe on the sort of the hyper local partnerships that you can create or the hyper hyper local collaborations that you can create versus saying right i'm going to go and partner with the biggest brand or supplier i'm going to partner with the biggest uh, channel or the biggest network or the biggest influencer or however you define partnership or collaboration for, for that industry that you're working in um is you know do you have a particular suggestion as to or i guess suggestion or thought as to whether people should be looking at the big collaborators versus the sort of the hyper local industries high ships high street stores startups on a hyper local level I, th I think in increasingly. I mean, I use football as one example because there's there's a it's a it's a, it's a good illustration there. But and it's a very defined fan base. But actually, what you're touching upon is something that's really important because what we're seeing increasingly is there's a greater localization in terms of the consumer mindset. So there is a there's a pullback away from sort of the globalization and the the big brands, the 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 big shopping malls, et cetera, or certainly the, the big supermarkets. And a lot of people are now focusing very much on the smaller brands that have the sustainability, that have something somewhat different about them. And actually the in the, the world of e-commerce is 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 ripe for that because you have the ability as a small startup to bring your brand to market. And clearly when you're in that space, you're very, very focused on the consumer demographic. So you tend to find brands that are very, very focused already. And from a, a partnership perspective, there are examples where, again, two smaller brands come together, sharing that same demographic. There is a power in that. And they like tends to attract like. And what you find, and we're seeing this, you know, within the Alvio network right now, is that over time, the network effect starts to take shape, and brands naturally start to find partners that they're they're comfortable working with. And I have a great example. Um, there's a there's a brand called um, Chefs for Foodies, uh, which is on the Alvio network. Now, Chefs for Foodies is uh, again, it has it has a, a, a very very specific look and feel about what they do. Um, a very well-defined um, ethos around the way they operate, and it's a it's a marketplace is probably not the right terminology, but it's certainly an on, it's an online retailer that has multiple brands, and they are brands that if you're a foodie, you like cooking your own food, you like doing dinner parties, um, you you will go there to find the products that you want, for the ingredients for the dishes that you want to make. And what we've seen is that over the last uh, few weeks, they've started to integrate some some brands throughout using Alvio, um, whereby they are bringing 
some differential into their into their offering and so it's a, it's a good example it's a long way from the sort of the, the well-known football clubs right the way through to the chef to food example where you have artisan products that are being placed into a, a marketplace that has a demographic that is a demographic that they're looking to work with yeah, I mean that's that's I think those are kind of really really good examples, as you say, away from the football analogy, which is kind of everybody kind of recognises, but actually it kind of spans so many industries and so many examples, um, which kind of just just makes a huge a huge amount of sense. Um, and I guess that I, was, I mean my next question was actually going to be kind of talking about and and, and you, I think you mentioned when we've talked about in terms of the the report, you've talked about how giants like Amazon are seen as sort of a competitive threat and and i guess by kind of taking a step back from that and and going kind of thinking local thinking affinity with values that's how you counteract that threat right yes and actually i've got a really interesting example um you may have picked up recently that uh, oxford street in london uh, and westminster council is bringing in a, a, a really unique initiative and and it's going to be interesting to watch this one play out you might you might know if you've ever visited Oxford Street that the eastern end is is full of um, not particularly interesting shops. There's a lot of uh, American sweet shops and a variety of different sort of knockdown cheap shops. And what it's done is it's 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 given an impression of Oxford Street that isn't what Westminster Council wants to project. And they started an initiative last year, and it's starting to to take shape now where. They're ending the leases of these different companies or these different retailers, and they're offering retail space on Oxford Street for artisan companies, independent companies, startup companies to come in and actually offer something very, very different. So, and I'm talking about the bricks and mortar environment just because it it it, it gives a if you like a really really clear example of a change of attitude and if you like the support that a council can actually give locally for interesting brands new brands startup brands artisan brands to come in and actually provide a lot of choice and a lot of variation on a high street now the same applies within e-commerce and the the amazon you know a amazon has done some interesting things for e-commerce clearly it's it's set an expectation in terms of of delivery times we expect our products now to be delivered on time within you know, 24 hours, 48 hours. So it's set a standard for that. But on the flip side, Amazon creates a lot of waste. A lot of products go to landfill. Um, and, and also they have a negative effect on, on brands because brands find that they don't get the full value, uh, margin value when they're selling through Amazon often. Um, and Amazon does have a, a history of, of of uh, copying brands and uh, and selling products, copied products for a discounted price. So stripping a lot of value from that. So going back to your point about the, the sort of flip side to Amazon is, again, it's about strength in numbers, brands coming together to collaborate around a common purpose, around a common consumer and around a common way of thinking. And the more that happens and the more that, that sort of network effect takes over as, as brands start to collaborate, Yes, it's going to be difficult to take on the likes of Amazon in a pure head-to-head -head fashion, but the decentralization of business and the, the, the way the consumer is starting to move away from these big, big centralized monopolies, I think is going to be very interesting to watch over the next couple of years. And I think the landscape is going to look very, very different in the next sort of three to four years around smaller brands coming together and collaborating than than what we're seeing today i think there will be a big shift by then yeah so i think it's super interesting about how people are kind of taking a step back and i think you know maybe we're seeing that as well in terms of on high street maybe people are taking a step back from maybe the really big well-known brands and going more to sort of local kind of family family run high street stores and and the such like so, uh, the same thing is playing out kind of in the e-commerce world as, it, as it's playing out on the high street in that sense absolutely what kind of assuming now that the therefore that the 2024 is going to be all about partnerships as part of, of e-commerce getting stronger and stronger but you know you're going to be going under 
undergoing this journey. You're going to start up with some partnerships. You've identified them. You've gone through all the process that you've that you've talked about. Is there any kind of sort of metrics or KPIs that that, that brands can track to help measure the success of an e-commerce partnership? You know, so that they can sort of then say, look, you know what, we've taken the leap. We're going to do partnerships. We're going to going to sign up to a couple that we think have got less great affinity. How the hell do we measure this when we get to December 2024? Yeah, and I, so a key a key measure there is your return on investment. And uh, if you think about the cost, it's it's comparing the cost between the margin sacrifice that you that you have when partnering with another retailer so you you you're sacrificing a margin to them as a, as a retailer you're selling to them at a, a trade price so they're taking maybe 20% versus the cost of driving traffic to your own website that's that's a really really clear metric um because obviously if you're partnering with somebody who is is then retailing your product you're you're giving up that margin sacrifice on a guaranteed sale Whereas you're paying for PPC to drive traffic to your website, you're spending a lot of money up front. And, and what's the conversion rate look like? Is it five percent? Is it is it ten percent? So that's that's one of the clear clear measures. Um, I think also, again, it's it's also about driving greater brand awareness. So you get also. So I'm talking. The first example I'm giving you is 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 a more immediate, short term. You can measure that very very quickly. But actually, the longer term value is is also where you're partnering with the right partner and you form a relationship where you can also work collaboratively to get greater awareness of your brand for longer term awareness and then growth. It's a different form of measurement, but actually it's 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 all about having that mindset and an eye on sustainable growth, long term sustainable growth. And I think you you need to give it a bit of time in order to measure what those results look like but again if you put in the if you put in the, the the smart work at the front end and you choose the right partner with the right demographic and the right partnership attitude then you're in a, you stand a much much greater chance for longer term sustainable growth around that do you think that people in that effect do you think that brands when they undergo partnerships and collaborations whatever word you put to it do you think that they that they should be focusing maybe more weighted towards brand awareness and therefore longer term versus kind of immediate return on investment in, in regards to sort of money in, money out. Um, I, I kind of, I think it's really interesting that you kind of bring that up and those two things, you know, whether you've, you've heard about the example recently of um, the smokeless stoves and, and the partnerships going on there and the CEO of, um, um, being being let go because they they wanted to do this big marketing collaboration influencer collaboration and then that going all south because they weren't getting the return on investment without realizing that actually what they were doing was brand awareness so do you think that there should be an a a, a sort of a, a higher weighting towards brand awareness versus monetary financial in versus finance out there's always there's always a, a financial reality You've got to pay the. You've got to. You know, it's got to pay its dues. Uh, the money needs to be coming in. So, look, I, I, I think the, the there's there's always there's the transactional element versus the the long the long term growth, and I think it's always finding that balance between between the two. Um, my instinct would be that you want to drive long term sustainable growth, and if you get the brand awareness piece right, then the money follows the financial piece follows but you it's it's always that conflicting priorities between the balance sheet versus the brand growth the brand long term growth and then you know the, the the longer term value that you get from that there's no one solution attached to that but no, again no, I, I realize I that say, I, um... I would say if you if you again if you're you're selecting the right partnership and you put the right partnership elements in place at the very, very beginning, then you should be seeing a return relatively quickly. And if you're not seeing any transactions taking place within the first sort of four weeks or so, I think I'd be questioning and re-looking at the efforts that are being made. And I, and, and again, within e-commerce, I would also say that um, 
you enter into a partnership with the same mentality as you would do with a bricks and mortar relationship. If you're launching a product in in Boots, and I've you know I've I've launched products in Boots and and, and Tesco's and Asda's and, and and many different retailers in the in the bricks and mortar space, you never launch a product within a shop and then just hope that it goes on the shelf and that it sells. You you would have a launch strategy. You would want visibility. You'd want to make sure there was an education piece for the consumers to understand that brand. And the same applies in e-commerce. The tools are just slightly different. So within an e-commerce world, you'd want your brand to have some prominence probably on the homepage during that launch phase. The world of social media opens up all sorts of opportunities for consuming or, or, or for uh, communicating with the consumer. So you'd be collaborating with that partner to make sure that your brand message gets out to their audience. There are tools that place products into the upsell funnel. So again, you, you'd be collaborating with that partner. And if your product is a great upsell product alongside their core product, make sure it goes into the upsell funnel. And you may sacrifice some, uh, some additional margin during that launch period in order to incentivize that partner to, to push your product. But I think if you've got all of those ingredients in place during the launch phase, if you like, the transactional results should follow. You, sh you should be seeing a return on that investment pretty quickly. If, if you just passively hope that it's going to happen, um, then I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's all about sort of you know preparation, preparation, preparation. As 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 it, it would be how I guess you're going to sum it up is the fact that you don't you know you may want to do it and you may want to do it quickly, but but it's also worth taking some time to to think about uh, the right approach and you know, the strategic approach to it. To, to sort of sum up, you've kind of covered quite a lot already. And already, I, I would imagine that anybody listening to this whole interview would be able to sort of say, right, you know what, if I was hesitant before, I, I've now got a good idea about why I should be entering into partnerships and collaborations going forward into 2024. Two questions to sort of sum up. Firstly is, are partnerships and collaborations for everybody? And that's a big question, I know, because you're going to try to, to cover every single brand in every single industry. But but is it for everybody if it's going to be a key trend for 2024? Or is there a chance that you could be looking at it and go, you know what, it's just not for us, for X, Y, and Z. And what could those X, Y, and Z be? The second thing is anybody who is, the second question, to, I guess, to sum up is anybody who is hesitant, what should be their number one question that they ask themselves or information and insight that they find out before they launch into an investigative strategy uh, for a partnership or collaboration? Yeah, so the, to answer the first question, generally we, we're naturally inclined to want to partner and work together collaboratively. It's, it's, uh, it's lonely to be on your own and it is increasingly becoming tougher for brands to work in, in pure isolation. However, a lot of it comes down to mindset, and it probably isn't for everybody. Um, there will there, there are likely to be brands out there right now that have carved a niche for themselves and feel that they're very, very unique and, and, and they do what they do and they'll never go beyond that. But I would say that if, if a brand like a Red Bull, for example, can partner with a GoPro, two very, very strong brands, then it should be there for everybody. And the key thing really is down to the attitude that the people behind those brands have for collaboration and working working with others. So that that would be the the, the underlying message there. Um, but it's again, I always come back to it's always the important thing is understanding who you're working with and making sure that you're reaching an audience that is the audience that you want to reach and the audience that is right for your brand. If you have a focus on the audience, first and foremost, then the rest is more likely to follow because ultimately it is the consumer that is the most important element within this. Remind me on the yeah. second question. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess the second question was anybody who is, you, and you've kind of answered it there anyway, in a, in, in a way and, and through the previous interview, but I guess anyone was anybody who is, who is hesitant, who is kind of, I get it, I understand the benefits. I understand the, the, as to kind of where we can go from here. 
Um, but I'm still I'm still on, on the fence about this. I still am not quite sure if it's right for us. What's the number one question that they should be answering for themselves to sort of make that decision? Maybe either a yes or a no, but at least making the decision to, to take the leap. The answer I give to that would be, that again, look at the consumer that you're looking to reach and look at the values of the brand that you're looking to partner with. And if your if your values align, if the consumer is the, the demographic that you're looking for, then there really shouldn't be a reason not to partner with that with that company, with that brand. Um, and I would always say, be bold and give it a go. Just do it, to coin a phrase. Because you can always pull back if it's if it doesn't work for you. But I would always suggest giving it a go. Yeah. And maybe maybe that's going to be ultimately the key in 2024 as well is 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 partly experimentation with some of these things as we figure out what works for us in e-commerce you know in a in a world that now can of in an e-commerce world where you can go in so many different directions in your strategy and your tools and your channels maybe the kind of key to it and partnerships being part of that is being kind of experimentation give it a go see what works um, if this doesn't work, maybe a different partnership will, a different approach will, but it's worth giving it a shot because it could just be the thing you're looking for. And I, and I always advise the brands that we're working with, get the first one in the bag first. Be focused. Find out what works for you. Find out the key ingredients of, of what works for a partnership for your particular brand. And then if it works, you can then start to replicate it. But do that first one first. Make sure that it works and then scale from there. That would be my, my suggestion.